Okay, welcome everyone. I am Kevin Hurley. Glad to be with you here today. Today is 103. We're going to go over, last but not least, how to achieve a great return while protecting your portfolio and really how you can do it yourself. The whole reason why I'm giving these webinars is to give you the opportunity to be able to see what's working in the stock market and to be able to have the opportunity to do it yourself if you choose. If not, I obviously want to offer my services to you so that as, as you run into issues or the stock market, maybe you're not getting what you'd expect or what you receive out of your returns, you've got a viable option of someone that can obviously do it for you if needs be. A small group here today. I'm going to direct a couple questions to the group. Please be, uh, uh, well, please feel free to ask any questions you'd like. Please feel free to make sure that uh, all your questions are answered. At the end, I do have a short Q&A that literally is set up for you guys to get any questions you would like answered from a registered investment advisor. If I can, one more time, I want to go through the simple fact that the best investors that are out there control their risk and they do something that is extremely hard for the everyday individual. They diversify in a way that makes you guys think you're not going to make enough money. So there's, there's the issue right there. They diversify in a way that, that, that retail investors feel they won't make enough money doing so. It's kind of funny to a certain degree because when I say they control risk, they understand the simple chart of this metric right here. Absolutely ridiculous that they get this, but we don't. We don't understand for some reason that a 50% drop means we need to get 100%. We got to do twice to get 100% return to get it back. What smart money does is they diversify in a way that gives them the ability to truly, um, for lack of a better a better term that truly gives them the ability to um, to buffer their investments within the stock market. Smart money is always going to be in a position where these risks don't occur or are, how would I say it, or are an issue for them. In fact, for the most part, smart money risk is different and I think it's going to benefit us if we do more of the smart money risk tolerance. What that means, plain and simple, we need to do some more risk free investing. That usually means that we might not make as much to the upside, but that allows us to not lose as much to the downside and I think that is a key point that we need to understand we need to be willing to adjust our our diversification model into asset backed investments now we might, may, might be able to do arbitrage or black box investing but we can follow the 80 20 rule which means try to get 80 percent of our profits from 20 percent of our investments, making the other part, the other investments that we're doing, a um, just a smarter way to to practice. Big money hedges everything that goes in the stock market. Everything that goes in, they hedge. One of the key rules that I think we don't understand: nothing goes into the stock market or goes into an investment from, inst from the institutional side that isn't hedged in some way, shape, or form. A pretty basic hedging strategy follows that asset allocation model. It seems out of the gate, big money puts 
20% of a $100,000 investment into treasury securities. Something that's pretty liquid, something that guarantees over a 30 year period of time, 3% a year, maybe down to two and a quarter, right? They always seem to put 20% into bonds. So a $100,000 portfolio, they're gonna take 20K and invest in some of the best of the best. These are not high risk bonds, they can be, but for the most part, this is a bond fund, a PIMCO, an Apple bond fund, and a Microsoft bond fund, something that gives them a 3 to a 5% return. They always go into some type of asset-backed securities. I'm going to throw a couple out there. Most asset-backed securities are going to be a gold, a silver. It could be oil, gas, coal. There's a lot of things that are asset-backed securities. But one of the most common ones is a commercial real estate where they buy up a 10 or $20 million building so that even in the face of a recession, a Fortune 1000 or a Fortune 2000 company isn't going to be going out of business and they're still going to take their monthly rent. It's like flipping homes. Pretty interesting to understand. If you just do the math on these, and I'm going to try to choose a pen color here that you guys can see. Let's see if I can't choose a green. Treasuries nets 3%. Bonds net a 3 to 5%. Usually an asset-backed security like oil or, or what have you, whether it's a gain or a tax write-off, is usually somewhere between a 7 to a 13%, depending on how risky it is. Commercial real estate is usually somewhere between a 6 to an 8. If we take the low side, 3, 3, seven, six, we get a 19% cushion. If we take the high side, three, five, 13, eight, um, 21, 26, 29. They've given this portfolio a 19 to a 29% cushion. So when they do bring in the stock market, that cushion, if I go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to put that backwards. That cushion from all these benefits that are down below, that cushion of 19 to 29% is protecting the riskiest investment that they do, which is the stock market. Can you guys see? I'd like a comment on this. Can you guys see how they've built in a buffer to any money they put into the stock market in the first place? Give me a couple comments here. Can you guys see the buffer that they've put into any stock market investment by the way that they diversify? Yes, no, maybe so. <laughs> Thanks, Travis. Travis says, yeah, it's kind of amazing. It is kind of amazing. How would you like to know that if you put anything in the stock market, you could lose up to 29% in the stock market and still not have your portfolio go down? Maybe 19%. You could lose 19% on that 20% of your portfolio and still not lose money over the year. I like those numbers. Now, again, I hear most people, for crying out loud, why does Big Money Diversify like this? It comes right back down to an asset allocation model, but more importantly, if you remember, it comes down to that um, compounding interest theory. You don't want to knock off those 20, 19, 18 year blocks where you have all this growth. You always want to make something year in and year out so it compounds on itself and so it grows. Now, unfortunately, what I don't like about Wall Street is they're going to tell you this is an asset allocation model that requires this type of hedge to follow the Harry Markowitz efficient frontier model. Someone once said, well, what the heck is that? <laughs> There's the Harry Markowitz efficient frontier model, 
and this is why it's so hard to come by. They got to plug everything into computer program. We're on that left-hand side, cash, inflation, intermediate, short-term, high yield, all these bonds on the left-hand side, growth and equities, large cap, mid cap, international. They're trying to fit all of those positions onto that line and give you an average growth curve that's nice and smooth. Unfortunately, as we've learned, in real life, all these things are going all over the place, and it is impossible to place them nice and comfortably. Very easy. Oh, I got a computer model that just places all of these things on this nice growth curve, and off you go, so you're good to go. That's why investing hasn't given people the returns that they've wanted. The model is a fundamentally and in theory a sound model it just doesn't work in real life it's too hard to place REITs and mid caps and get them in a range that will fit on that curve through diversification we found that out in 2008 the real reason why these guys are hedging this way why they divided their portfolio this way part of it also comes down to cost they get to charge you more Hey, I'm going to diversify for you so I can charge you all kinds of ridiculous fees. Oh, and by the way, every two years, I've got a better fund. So we've got to take that fund out, take out the Merrill Lynch fund, and put you into the Fidelity fund. Take out the Fidelity, put you in the Oppenheimer. Take out the Oppenheimer, put you in the Vanguard. I think to a certain degree, it gives people a, a way to, to churn your portfolios. What I do know is this, even though parts of their theory and parts of what they do isn't fair, it costs too much, it doesn't mean as individual investors we can't learn from what big money is trying to do. It doesn't mean we can't take the best of the best out of what they do. In fact, we want to change those odds of profitability into our, our favor. I went over it with you last week. I'm going to go over it with you one more time. When you buy to open a stock position, will someone please tell me what is your risk in that stock position? If you buy a stock position, what is your risk in that stock position? Someone please tell me. Okay. I just want to get that in a minute. How about anyone else? What's the risk when you buy to open a stock position? What, what risk are you taking? Someone just typed in 100%. There you go. Someone just typed in everything. There you go. Every penny, right? If every penny's at risk, you've got to lower that risk. Big money lowers the risk in the diversification. Big money lowers the risk, giving your stock market positions. I'm going to go back one more time. How does big money diversify that risk? Somewhat like this, right? They give that stock market position a 19 to 29% buffer from 3% from treasury bonds, 3 to 5% from corporate bonds, could be anywhere from 7 to 13 percent from asset backed securities that put you in some commercial real estate. This is what accredited investors do to protect themselves, to give them that cushion where they could lose 19 to 29 percent in the stock market and still not have lost any money overall in their portfolio. Now, some of us are going to say, Well, I need to grow my money faster than that. And now when it comes back down to odds of profitability. When you buy it open a stock position, you got a one out of three chance of making money. 67% chance of losing money in the position. We don't have an infinite time horizon. So we've got to, even with our money in the stock market, everyday people, we've got to do a better job of protecting our investment. One of the easiest things to do is buy it open a long put that acts as insurance. And if I can go ahead and, and 
put this through you just like I did last time. One more example, right? If we buy a $100 stock, we've got at risk $100. So what we do is we increase our cost basis by maybe $4.50 to protect our stock, have the right to sell, at $100 and we may give this out for about two months in time and that's going to get us through our earnings that we have coming up right we've increased our cost basis our new cost basis is not just a hundred dollars it's a hundred and four dollars and fifty cents but one more time to the group what is our risk in this trade if we have bought the right to sell our stock at $100? What is our risk in this trade for the next two months? Someone tell me. We've bought to open the long put. We've bought an insurance basically on our stock for eight, nine weeks. We've got the right to sell it at 100 bucks. There you go. Yeah, your risk now is no longer $100 a share. Your risk is $4.50. Thank you, Travis. $4.50 a risk. In plain English, you are now protecting... 90, what, 95.5% of your total invested capital is no longer at risk. You're only risking 4.5% of your total invested capital. Let me say that one more time. You're only risking 4.5% of your total invested capital. If you are willing to cap yourself to the upside at a pretty great return, if you're willing to be obligated to sell your stock at a certain price for a certain period of time, you could be in a risk-free trade. I may suggest you guys take a look at uh, hurleyinvestments.com blog site or myhurleyinvestments.com. Let's see, today is the 26th, so by uh, 5 p.m., Mountain Standard Time, I'm going to throw three 100% risk-free trades up there on the website for you guys to have a better understanding of how to create possibly a risk-free trade, possibly a very low-risk trade, possibly um, a trade where you can protect 95.5% of your total invested capital. I don't expect you to understand all this right out of the gates, but you're more than welcome to give me a quick call or an email. Probability rates of return. By diversifying like big money, by protecting your money in the stock market, you dramatically increase the probability of a rate of return. If you just let it sit, look at how this market has been jagging how you might go through 12 and a half to 13 years of no growth in your portfolio. Guys, this is the S&P 500. We need to find a way over a period of time with these drops to capture some profitability and some a chance to take that and use that to our advantage. We don't have an infinite horizon time for retirement. If we were retiring at the, any of those peaks, my goodness, could you see half your money disappear and still feel comfortable about retirement? Guys, these miracles take time. Why, are we, why am I pushing that it's so important to protect your money? One big year that you lose knocks off possibly the most important year of your retirement. If you went through three or four years just to get back to break even, I guess it's been five to six years, 
since 2008, you literally, you literally have cut your potential earnings and your potential retirement out by 40%. We can't let that happen to us. We've got to change what we're doing no matter how uncomfortable it is. We've got to make better decisions to give ourselves every opportunity to have our money work harder than we do. <clears throat> this is not rocket science. This is simple facts and figures. <coughs> Excuse me. Kevin, I don't understand asset-backed securities. Plain and simple, an asset-backed security, in theory, is an asset that can't go to zero in value. It's typically been for the credit investors only, and those asset-backed securities are sometimes homes, trying to flip homes. It's been oil. It's been gold. It's been commercial real estate. Now, we've obviously seen oil and gold prices tumble like there's no tomorrow. Again, when you're a credit investor and have millions upon millions of dollars, it's somewhat easier to sit through those falls. Everyday people like uh, you and I don't have that opportunity. Well, Kevin, I like the idea of, of flipping real estate. You know, I did until I tried it. I did until I rented it out. I did until I had someone destroy a basement and wipe out three or four years of profit. And I'm really, I'm going to have to wait about 11 and a half to 15 years to break even on the property. All because of one bad weekend and a divorce. But an asset in theory, an asset is some type of, of investment that in theory cannot go to zero. Where can I suggest you put your money? Well, if you were an accredited investor, it'd be commercial real estate. It's a safety net against losses. It's a hedge against the market risk. It's about as risk-free as possible if it's done correctly. And it's cash flowing revenue. The question is, well, Kevin, I don't have $2 million to go put in this to let it sit 10 to 20 years. In all honesty, neither do I. I don't have it either. But there is a company out there that's taught me the keys. That said, you know what? When you're buying a million-dollar building, you want to have a 60% loan to value. 70% occupancy is, is nice, but you know what? If you just had a, if you start out the same percent occupancy and you lost 20, 25%, as long as you're at 45% occupancy, you still are going to cover your mortgage because of the 60% loan to value. You need to have building management with a reasonable cap fee. And you need something that's going to be some capital appreciation. That's why you're in this. Not just to create a revenue stream, but to have some capital appreciation. Typical asset back investing for these, you know, credit investors is a six-month commitment period where they gather up money, 18 months where they deploy it and buy the buildings, and then as an investor, you sit and you wait for eight to 20 years. In real life, we can't wait. I couldn't wait that long. So there is an opportunity through BCLS Capital that's giving everyday people for that fifty to hundred thousand dollar range, the ability to invest in commercial real estate. B sales capital, in my opinion, is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It gives everyday Americans the ability to do nothing more than to invest like the credited investors. A little bit different that you buy into an LLC formation. BCL manages the whole commercial real estate process. They've got a high annual target rate of return. They close that LLC in one to three years, so you don't have to wait eight to 20 years. Gives you that long-term capital gains taxation. And the neat thing is, this is the first company that I've seen that have given you what's called a kicker, or they give you the ability to participate in the sale of the building and the capital appreciation. Most commercial real estate opportunities do not give you that opportunity. The company takes it all. Guys, I'm just trying to show you ways to beat Wall Street. I've tried to give you three classes to give you the best idea of how everyday people can protect their money and be successful in Wall Street. If you guys don't mind, copy down my information there. Copy down my toll-free number. 
please leave me a message. You've got my website. They can get a hold of me there. You have an email. I'd like to be able to help you in any way possible protect your retirement. We can't afford to lose our money like big money. We can't afford to be in the position that they are in. We can't afford to have to work to the last day that we die. Life wasn't meant to be that way. I asked you a question the first, uh, the very first presentation. Has Wall Street offered you the opportunity to retire on your terms? To be able to do and pay for everything you wish to in retirement? It can. It's just a matter of making a couple changes to get there. Guys, this was the end of my presentations. Are there any questions you have that you would like to ask me in regards to, to what you've seen? If not, I'm going to wish you well, and I'm going to hope to hear from you in the very near future.